Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to cover the history of Florida with us today. We will be moving through the history of the state from the time of the first Spanish explorers in the 1500s all the way up to the mid-1900s. We will gradually shift gears towards a more focused discussion about the history of our area, Northwest Florida. But before we dive in, we want to tell you all about amphibious archaeology and what our focus is here in the community and online. We are a group of proud Floridians who are always looking for any way to reconnect with the past and to uncover lost relics of bygone eras. We all have a soft spot in our hearts for the past and we try to entertain as well as educate through our videos and interactive posts. We are all outdoorsmen, we metal detect, bottle hunt, scuba dive, and take backpacking trips deep into the undeveloped wild of Florida in search of lost relics and untainted experiences. If you like today's video and want to see more, take a look through our videos on YouTube and check them out. See what you think, and then uh, leave us a comment down below. Thank you, guys. For many of us, Florida is and will always be home. Many people outside of the state only associate us with beautiful beaches, world-class fishing, and alligators. But we want to focus on one of the other strengths, the deep history and long past of our great state. We want to give you all an overview of Florida's past and then dive into the area that matters the most to us here, the Panhandle. Let's start our little adventure back in the 1500s, when Spanish exploration brought over several well-known figures into the New World. Florida's past is riddled with conflict and turmoil from almost the very start. Juan Ponce de Leon, who at the time was serving as the governor of the province of Hispaniola for Spain, set out on a series of expeditions which led him to explore an island close to him, now known as Puerto Rico. Moving on from there, De Leon began searching for the fabled island known as Bimini in search of the Fountain of Youth. This search brought him to the coast of Florida in 1513, where De Leon declared the land for Spain and dubbed it La Florida, in honor of the Catholic observation of the Easter Feast, or Pascua Florida. The actual location of his landing is often disputed, but most historians can agree that he arrived somewhere between Jacksonville and Daytona Beach. Ponce de Leon would return years later in 1521 with the intention to colonize the peninsula, but hostile Native American attacks would prove fatal to both the expedition and its leader. After a few failed expeditions in the years following Ponce de Leon's death, Hernando de Soto, another famous Spanish explorer, would land with a large force just south of Tampa Bay in May of 1539. This force was a mixture of clergymen, soldiers, cavalry, and laborers. The outfit would work their way north and west into our area of the state. De Soto and his men ventured further west than his original expedition had proposed, resulting in some of the first known accounts that we have of explorers coming through the areas of modern-day Bay, Washington, and Gulf counties. We know this because several of the Sandhill Lakes, just north of Bay County, have been mapped and surveyed by this early explorer group. According to the Smithsonian, the St. Andrews Bay had seen Spanish use since as early as 1515, but the first written account of Spanish military activity in the area was in 1553 where a hurricane ravaged their fleet and hundreds of sailors lost their lives. Fires from the explosions on the ships, high winds and seas, and Native American attacks killed off most of the crew. History only knows of one survivor, and this man was able to reach Tampico, Mexico, where his account of the events was recorded. According to the local historian Ira Hutchison, there is a strong possibility that the widow and the children of the now deceased Ponce de Leon were a part of the far earlier, um, were a part of a far earlier voyage of ships that were pushed into St. Andrews Bay, and their remains are now said to be buried somewhere on Redfish Point. Although evidence for this claim has not been unearthed, it leaves a lot of clues to be examined by the modern day historian. As De Soto continued north into the heart of the southeast, one of his soldiers, a man simply remembered to history as Cabeza de Vaca, or Head of the Bull, returned to an area close to these grave sites of Lenore de Leon and her children. At this location, near modern-day Redfish Point, de Vaca found a permanent Native American village which provided him with much-needed shelter and supplies. 
For our story's sake, the last major event of the 16th century was the founding of the oldest city in the United States, St. Augustine. St. Augustine was a response to French pressure in the region. The French had established Fort Caroline in the, in the area of modern-day Jacksonville, and the Spanish needed to, re, needed to react quickly in order to maintain their claim on the territory. The 1600s were a relatively quiet time in our state's past. At the start of the century, in 1601, King Philip III of Spain commissioned an official map of Florida that featured a few prominent places that we still might recognize today. The predominant feature of this map is that it showcases a specific location where the king had chosen to be home to a new fort in the New World. The fort would be located near modern-day Miami and would serve as a stronghold for the region south of St. Augustine. Arguably, the most important event for the century in our region was the promotion of a man named Pedro de Abada to the office of governor in St. Augustine. Ibarra was a career soldier who was born in a region known as the Bay of Biscay along the Atlantic coast of Spain. After a long journey over from his home country, the two ships carrying supplies, riches, and most importantly, the newly appointed governor himself, were attacked off the coast of our state near Cuba. The ships were attacked by English pirates on August 28, 1603 and only Ibarra and a few crewmen managed to escape on one of the damaged ships. After making their way to Havana, they refitted and made their way to St. Augustine. Ibarra began to work towards repairing the relationship between the Spanish and the native people local to the area. The previous governor had severely angered the natives and created a sense of mistrust and animosity between the two groups. The new governor opened up a chance for redemption and friendship, which both sides welcomed wholeheartedly. Just a few years following Ibarra's appointment, an explorer-slash-cartographer stationed in St. Augustine named Alvaro Mexia was um, charged with finding the Ais Native American tribe who inhabited the land south of St. Augustine, towards modern-day Cape Canaveral. Mexia's di uh, diplomatic mission was a resounding success, and it formed the, quote, period of friendship between the two nations. The last major event of the 17th century for our story is the construction of the Castillo de San Marcos. Construction of the fortress began in 1672 and took a whole whopping 23 years to complete. The fortress was fully operational in 1695 and the Castillo de San Marcos is now a national monument and really a must see for anyone who travels to St. Augustine. All right, now we're going to move on to the 1700s. So as we move closer and closer to the modern day, we can see the benefits of modern history really come into play. We have many more accounts and many more detailed accounts of the events that transpired in this time period and on. We also start our transition from focusing on our great state as a whole and onto the specifics of our region. The Panhandle is often overlooked as a footnote in the state and the nation's history but there are so many fascinating local stories and events that are fragmented from the full story that they are all too often left out. We could go on for literally hours, jumping story to story, trying to cover every little anecdote that fits into the, uh, the, the narrative we want to tell. But the stories and events that have been chosen were done so to best fit today's narrative, and we hope to come back and cover more of these small stories in greater detail and give them the justice that they deserve. The first European settlers to come to our area landed somewhere between what is now Callaway and Mexico Beach. Unfortunately, most reports to governors and kings during this time were not specific, and the exact location of their landings and initial settlements were not stated in the correspondence that has survived until today. The Seven Years' War was the major catalyst for change in both our state and abroad. The war ran from 1756 until 1763, and the 1763 Treaty of Paris gave England autonomy over Florida and released Cuba from British control and back into the hands of the Spanish. This war is known by many historians and uh, major political figures over the course of history as the rightful First World War. The treaty would mark the end of the first Spanish rule over Florida. This would allow for rapid English ex expansion into the territory, and it would create many of the communities in the main body of the state that still exists today. 
Think about places like modern-day Duval, Baker, St. John's, and Nassau counties. British occupation is also, has also allowed for the construction of infrastructure and further exploration of the state. The Penton Leslie Trading Company, which was an English-owned enterprise, started the first recorded trading post in our region of the state in the year 1763. They had locations in the town of Wells, which sat near the eastern foot of the Hathaway Bridge. The settlement in Cedar, Key, uh, Cedar Creek, sorry, um, which is an area near Deer Point Lake, and also the town of Auburn, which is a small settlement near the entrance of the Intercoastal Waterway in East Bay, which uh, most of you might know is the bay in Callaway. They would also frequently do business with Fort Gadsden, which is a military encampment along the Apalachicola River. <clears throat> the following year, in an attempt to bring more settlers over from England, Commodore Johnstone of the British Navy began a major publicity campaign to attract would-be settlers to make the move and colonize our area of the new territory. Many people took the offer to become colonists because they wanted the chance at a fresh start in the new world, for both themselves and their families, to escape the generational struggles that they had faced for an unreasonable amount of time overseas. It would serve us well to talk about the Revolutionary War for Independence between the United States and England. The town of Wells would start to grow larger as more and more settlers flooded the region. Shops, bars, inns, and other establishments would be constructed as time grew on. The most noteworthy new establishment to arrive would be the first Masonic Lodge in our area, which was constructed in the town of Wells around 1765. The English presence was however not something that the Spanish welcomed, and through both skirmishes and political debate, the English holdings in our area were slowly whittled down to only a few remaining footholds. Most of the English settlements were taken into Spanish custody for a time, and the soldiers were not kind to the buildings and infrastructure that were in place. As time passed further, the 1783 Peace of Paris would put an end to the hostilities in the region and the English were permitted to keep the settlement of Wells. When the English settlers returned, however, they found their homes and businesses in such disrepair that they would have no option but to leave their new settlement and return to England. The second Spanish rule would now begin and continue on until the year 1821. We hope to cover the settlement of Wells in its own documentary, as well as the stories of other small settlements in the region. In 1784, a letter written by an English cleric named Thomas Robinson states that there were other settlements long before Wells, and amphibious archaeology is excited to explore this lead in the future and search for hard evidence of earlier British settlements in our area. The 1800s were a very turbulent time in Florida's past. In 1813, the Creek War began. The Creek War, also known as the Red Stick War, or the Creek Civil War, was a conflict fought between the Red Stick Creek Tribe and the state militia units all along the Gulf Coast and into southern Alabama. After a year of fighting, a leader of the militia, Major Uriah Blue, led a company of men deep into the Red Stick territory to defeat their forces and their leader, Chief Holmes. Andrew Jackson, who would later become America's seventh president, became involved in the war and began accusing Chief Holmes and his men of attacking settlers in the Bay County area. The Spanish were also rumored to have supplied the Red Sticks with weapons, ammunition, and supplies to further their efforts against the American militia forces. The majority of this fighting occurred near the Choctahatchee River Basin, but fighting would often stretch into our area of the Gulf Coast. In 1820, the town of Austerlitz was created. Austerlitz was founded near where modern-day Parker currently resides. Florida would finally become a U.S. territory in 1821 after the Transcontinental Treaty of 1819 was ratified two years later. Funds were immediately released and expanded on the only main road in our area at this point in time. Andrew Jackson, having fought the Native Americans in the region, push for these funds to be allocated to this quote military road which is now known or which is also known as the Bellamy Road in some places $5,000 in 1821 money was released for this road project 
This road took travelers from St. Augustine all the way to Pensacola. Washington County was created in 1825, and the map you see on the screen now is a period map of the region. You can see that Washington County used to be a massive parcel of land that encompassed the area of modern-day Bay County as well. In 1828, the first customs building was constructed on the St. Andrews Bay, and later, in 1836, the plan for the first college in our region was drafted. The St. Andrews College of West Florida would have been a center of knowledge for the Gulf Coast. It also would have added a fair number of buildings to the St. Andrews area, as they were already 32 according to maps of the time. Unfortunately, this project was abandoned when the first steam engine locomotive and railroad in our area was constructed in Port St. Joe. Messalina is a name that many Bay County residents would recognize, but not necessarily know why and its importance. In 1836, a free black Spanish merchant marine sailor named Jose Messalina jumped ship in the St. Joseph Bay and traveled to Redfish Point. Here, he began to start a homestead and build a small community. He would eventually travel to Georgia, where he would purchase a slave wife, and then go on to encourage over 40 black families to join him in his community. His son, Hawk Messalina, would also go on to be an influential member of the local area. Messalina Bayou, over near downtown Panama City, is named after Jose. According to correspondence from the region, there were roughly 1,800 permanent residents of St. Andrews in the year 1850. Caroline Lee Hintz and her daughter, Miss Julia Keyes, would stay in the St. Andrews area during the winter months, and the two women would often write about their experiences with local events and news during their stays on the Gulf. Overall, during the 1850s and 1860s, the main industries that kept the St. Andrews Bay area going were fishing and lumber. Fishing was the biggest by far, and was needed for food constantly, both locally and regionally. Local, local fishermen would provide a full service of catching, cleaning, and salting the fish, which would then be sold to locals and shipped in barrels to plantation owners around our area. Many locals will recognize this photograph. These are the salt pots over on Beach Drive. The salt production facilities were destroyed during the Civil War, and this would cripple the fishing industry in the region as they had no access to salt for preservation. In 1863, the USS Roebuck had anchored in the St. Andrews Bay while looking for Confederate ships thought to be hauling valuable goods such as cotton and gold. They had run low on supplies, however, due to overextension, and had to send a landing party to shore in order to secure supplies leaving only two soldiers to guard the ship. When the small landing party of ten began to search the land nearby, they had accidentally run right into a small Confederate detachment led by Captain Robinson, resulting in five deaths and five injuries for the landing party. Miraculously, the injured soldiers were able to retreat and live through the dangerous encounter. The Civil War was rough on our area of the state. We saw a large amount of fighting in Bay County, predominantly in the Beach Drive area and near Frankfurt Avenue. The Frankfurt Avenue skirmishes were largely over essentials like spring drinking water. Some of our videos showcase Civil War sites throughout Northwest Florida, and because of the rich history that those bring, we are always looking for the next undiscovered artifact site. After the Civil War had ended, the next big event for us would be the passing of the Homestead Act in 1885, which made a vast amount of land available for purchase for the small sum of one dollar per acre. Many large companies up north sought this opportunity out in order to turn a massive profit. The St. Andrew Railroad, Land, and Mining Company, based in Cincinnati, Ohio, snagged up a lot of the land available near St. Andrews Bay. They would announce in 1887 that they were selling tiny plots of land for $2 a piece. This resulted in massive profits as they sold over 300,000 units of land. 
This did, however, bring over an insane amount of new res residents, and prosperity came to our region. The St. Andrews Company used the sales line, quote, beautiful St. Andrews Bay, end quote, to push for interest in the land. Panama City, as we know it today, began as three separate homesteads in our area, one of which was owned by a man named J.R. Irwin, and this included the Harrison Avenue land. This was sold to a gentleman named George Jinks and platted in 1888 as Park Resort. Park Resort would later be changed to, uh, to Harrison after our ninth president, President William H. Harrison, and eventually, as we will see in the 1900s, Harrison would turn into Panama City. Florida at this point in time was really flourishing, and when we consider that modern advancements like air conditioning and refrigeration were on their way, many people would start to consider moving to Florida year-round. Although, AC had been invented in the mid-1800s by a doctor in Apalachicola, not too far from where we're talking about today, it would not see mainstream residential use until the 1950s. Harrison was renamed as Panama City and incorporated in the year 1909, being followed quickly by Millville and Linhaven in the year 1913. 1913 would also see Bay, Bay County established as a county in Florida, breaking away from the original Washington County from which it once resided. The famous one-room Callaway Schoolhouse was built a few years earlier in 1911 and saw use well up into 1936. Thanks to the Callaway Historical Society, who have preserved the building, visitors can still see what the old schoolhouse looked like in its former glory. Although Callaway would not be officially incorporated until 1963, the history of the area goes back decades prior, and there are hidden stories everywhere you look. Between the schoolhouse and the post office, which was built back in 1903, these laid the framework for a soon-to-be-thriving community. There is so much history packed into Callaway that we also plan to do a video that solely focuses on the town and its past, loaded in with little stories from local historians and little-known facts that most people wouldn't find in the average history book. Before we let you go today, we want to share some of our finds over the past year and a half with you. We have artifacts dating all the way back to the 16th century, and each time we go out on an expedition, we have no idea what we are getting into. The following clips were all filmed in Bay County, and the relics we have found are all prized treasures in our minds. After watching these clips, if you have any interest in metal detecting, bottle hunting, or any of the research that we do, please get in touch with us, and we would be glad to get you involved on any of these adventures. All right. All right, we're hunting the spot next to this ferry that we've hunted a, quite a bit, but every time we go back, it surprises us. And good grief. I found two nails, and I was thinking, all right, and I went back over it. Really? I went back over it, still had the same. Check it out, signal. folks. It is gleaming through really pretty. Oh, it's a mark. Oh, nice. Nice. I hope this wind isn't too bad for you guys. I'm going to try to reposition myself just a little bit. Can you tell? What Beautiful. This? Can you see a date? Let's see. Um, yep, 42. 42? Yep. Oh, wow. Oh, it's pretty, isn't it? Yeah, it's in great shape. I can't believe you've that seen. I mean, just for a reference, we are right there. <laughs> right by the truck. I mean, what? 20 feet, maybe? That's awesome. Nail. Right beside that nail, huh? No, no, there was two nails in there. Awesome, that's cool. Oh well, hopefully that's not the end of the silver then. No, I'm not telling you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a picture of this. <laughs> Send it to Marcus. Send it to Marcus. <laughs> oh, the truck, the truck. Well, guys, <laughs> we were joking about it in the truck, but um, I have just found my first war nickel. It's in quite a. A rough state here but it is a 19 let's see if you guys can see that it is a 1944 P it's been down there for quite some time but we were laughing about it in the truck but I'm I'm really new to metal detecting in general I mean I've done it you know with my dad for a long time we did it as when I was a kid and 
and this is really my first dive into it so uh this year's been full of a ton of firsts for me so this is my first war nickel and i'm really proud of it hopefully we'll keep digging them up this afternoon's been uh pretty good we've only been here for about 10 minutes and he's already found the murk and i found the war nickel so we'll see what it comes up with well mark's always stopping the hunt huh Look at that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Don't Is apologize. It a coin? <gasps> oh. oh my god, you guys. Wow. I don't know what I found that is literally the walker. first one. Yeah. Awesome. Bro. Check that out. Damn. It's war, but who cares? Ooh, man. I think it's a 1920. Let's see. Wow. That's beautiful. Look how gorgeous that is. All right, now get in the truck. That, that came up as a 9596. So, y'all won't believe this, but when I walked over there and started getting set up, an eagle took off from, really? from that tree right there. That is insane, that, Marcus. That's awesome. freaking beautiful, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. All right, don't leave me hanging now. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Sorry, I was living No, 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 please. That's fantastic. 1920. Oh, wow. Yeah. You've got to go to the truck and bring us water. <laughs> yeah. This has got to go in the pocket right here. Yeah, really. That's awesome. Congrats. I've never found a water. I found a quarter. Remember that little quarter? Man, that's huge. That is massive. That's a 50 cent piece. Isn't it? This entire thing could be full of that. I think so, yeah. Half dollar. Yeah, half dollar. I thought it was half dollar. These first three clips were so much fun. It shows you guys some really cool coins that we have found in the past. All of these just happen to be silver, but this is just a few. I, I spent maybe five minutes looking through our archives to find this footage. There's so many finds just like this, and they are everywhere if you get into the game. Now, these next two are far more exciting. They're two really rare items that I'm honestly still astonished that we found both of them. The credit definitely goes to dad, but stay tuned and you guys will see what I'm talking about. Okay guys, it's been a while since I uh, um, filmed anything, because we haven't found anything, a couple of Ouija's. I got a really good 28, 29 signal, and about six inches down, I pulled out this. That is a trigger guard to an old rifle. I'm going to see if I can find some a maker's mark. But that is awesome. Now that is definitely 1800s or before. Now this property dates back to I'm sorry, I'm trying to get you set up to where you can see this property dates back to the 1700s, but it was most recognizable for its um, ferry back in 1835 on out to the um, late 1800s. Now that right there, my friends, is cool. I'm going to have to do some research on it because I don't see any markings. But that was like from an old musket. All right, guys, I'm getting a 20, 21 signal, about eight inches down. I'm having a hard time finding it. So I'm gonna put you down here so you can see. It rang up a 2021, so I don't think. It's oh, it says one dime. All right. Wow. Is it seated? I don't know. <laughs> I'm afraid to flip it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, 1849. All right. Holy crap. Check that out. Good job. Good job, man. 1849. No, it's not my first. That's my oldest. That's sweet. It's my oldest. Holy 
crap anole. Look how good it looks. Yeah, it does look good. 1849. Wow. I think it says it's O mint mark. Oh, he'll we'll look it up real quick. Oh my God. I swear I thought it was going to be a penny. <laughs> That's a seeded. Yes, sir. So there isn't any fill over here. No. Uh uh. She said there was no fill. Holy. Let me shut that off. Check that out, guys. Holy crap. That is my oldest seeded to date. Oh man, that is awesome. I would have never thought, why would it ring up that low? I don't know. Oh man, I don't want to rub it anymore. I'm going to clean it. An O mint mark. Holy crap, 1849. Wow. Oh man, that is too. Awesome. Yes, Those two are by far some of the coolest things that we have ever found. Now, we did a little research and we consulted some experts and we spoke to a master gunsmith who dated that to be around the 1780, 1790 period for that trigger guard. Now, after doing a little bit more research, I've narrowed it down to a few different guns that have been produced from 1778 all the way up to about 1798. So there's a good 20 year period, but that is for sure a 1700s, you know, musket trigger guard. And, you know, finding that quality of item on a site really lets us know that we have dialed in, that our research is on point, and that the facts that we think we have straight really are paying off in the long run. Now, that seated Liberty Dime is fantastic. That is one of the best conditioned coins we have found in a while, and it is the oldest that we have pulled out of the earth. Now, like I said before, if anyone has any questions, or if any of you are interested in getting into this hobby, or you know, even just becoming a detectorist on the side, or following along with what we do, Get on the channel, you know, subscribe to us and follow us while we do different hunts. If you want to get into it, get in contact with us. We're affiliates with Kellyco, which is one of the largest metal detecting supply companies in the Southeast. And if you need anything, get a hold of us. We'll help you out, we'll hook you up, and we'll get you in touch with a machine that will get you started at a price point that you can stomach. Thank you so much for watching our video today. We hope that you enjoyed our brief tour of Florida's history, and we hope to see you again soon on another adventure. Thank you all.